Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon, and I'm the Dean of Graduate Studies at Charles Darwin University. Welcome to Outrider 48, Making Tough Decisions. This Outrider comes via request from the legendary Sam. I've been working with Sam in the two years after he completed and graduated from his PhD. And Sam has been in survival mode. Terrible things have occurred to him and we're trying to create some momentum in his life. He's a wonderful human being, great friend of mine, legendary human. And Sam asked me if I would talk about some methodologies, some protocols for making difficult or tough decisions without relying on emotion. So when there's emotion everywhere, how do we actually construct a proper decision? So thank you, Sam. Absolutely astonishing request, this one. This one really did change me. There's that old cliche, we teach what we need to learn. And it's certainly true this week because I'm moving through a period in my life when I'm making some very, very, very big and tough decisions. So what I've learned this week in response to Sam's request is really transforming my life as well. So Sam, thanks, mate. So we need to look at what I think is the new literature, particularly on decision making. When you look at decision making literature, it's a bit uneven. But particularly when you look at the material 2020 on, some very provocative insights are provided methodologically but also diagnostically. It's been a fascinating process for me. Now we all know that cliche, hindsight is 2020. So when we look back on our past decisions, we always ask, what the hell was I thinking? We're going to talk about that today. What we need to try and do, if possible, is stop hindsight, stop teleology, and create a strategy and a plan that is accountable and meaningful and repeatable when we're thinking about making changes in our lives. So we have three parts in the Outrider this week. Firstly, we're going to construct a methodology for Sam. So in a tough time, with lots of emotion everywhere, let's construct a process to work through decision-making. Brilliant. The second part, we're investigating a diagnostic. So looking pretty carefully at our past decisions and how to manage the regret and the problems and actually understand what occurred, what actually happened rather than moving through life with regret. And of course, we finish off by trying to improve our decision making in the present. So really sit in our present and come up with some very quick and clear strategies to improve the decisions that we make today. Wow, this has been brilliant. So let me be really honest with you all at the start. During my life, I have made some absolutely catastrophic decisions. In fact, when I look at most of the decisions in my life, they have been epic, catastrophic failures. I can't believe the mistakes that I've made in my life. So as, I, so as I've been reading the research on decisions, it has been quite cathartic for me because it's allowed me to not only make peace with my past, but to understand it a lot better and learn from those decisions. It is weird, you know, at my incredibly advanced age to see decision making and see my decisions in a completely different context and in many ways forgive myself understand my previous self and also understand why those decisions were made. So Sam, I thank you for this. This really has been a transformative moment of my life. And look, the research is uneven, but there are some absolute gems there. So let's go for it. And let's start why decisions are important. So much of our lives, whether we're living them online or offline, involve a sort of talking with people you know, and having a chat about stuff. But really, we're not having a chat about stuff, are we? We're complaining about things a lot. We're complaining. And every day, we're walking through life, and it just doesn't seem right. The PhD's rubbish. The decisions that we're making are rubbish. The job is rubbish. Family relationships are rubbish. I'm sort of becoming Eric Morecambe, you know, wandering around going, rubbish! Rubbish. And that's sort of how life feels a lot of the time. So something is wrong. 
something's wrong and we can't really locate what is going wrong. This results in confusion and complaints and fear and anger. It also triggers insecurity, I think, because we're frightened of the unknown. And all of this, by the way, are, they're all legitimate emotions. But if we can start to understand the unknown, or indeed at least respect the unknown, then we can configure a methodology to carefully and quietly walk through the unknown and understand what is happening. Two emotional states in particular block good decision making. The first is insecurity. We know that something's not right, but we just can't work out what it is. And then, of course, the second really complicated emotion is that white panic or the despair or the desolation, where we sort of ask, look, I'm not sure I can get through another day living like this, right? They are very difficult states from which to make a decision. But of course, ironically, they're mostly the states where we do make decisions. So the problem is life is full of decisions. And if we delay making those decisions, then they sort of pile up on us and we're cornered and we have to make a really bad decision. And these are often reactive decisions. We are reacting to a pretty toxic environment. The best way to make decisions is to get ahead of the problem and make proactive decisions. So life is happening to us. We all know life at the moment is pretty well brutalizing. That's the best word I think to describe it. But if in this brutalizing environment, we can just get a little bit ahead, a little bit logical and rational, we can make proactive decisions. And that therefore increases what we know and increases the parameters over which we have control. So let's talk about making these proactive decisions. This is our methodology. Now, what we need to do is sit with a large bit of paper or indeed one of my whiteboards here's my baby whiteboard sit with if you know if you're making a lot of decisions sit with a big whiteboard but sit with a big bit of paper or a whiteboard and put in two columns two columns right first column what is going well second column what is not going well thanks for playing so do a full diagnostic and at this point it doesn't matter how detailed this is you might just be listing what's going wrong and listing what's going well but if you're like me at the moment then there's very very little in the positive column absolutely everything is in what's going wrong and it is a really really long list and I understand that but the great thing about a list like that if you've got a hell of a lot in the wow, this is a mess, what's going wrong, what needs to change, right? If you've got a lot going on in that list, that's completely okay. Because what you've done there is you've demonstrated, you've got evidence to show why you're miserable, why you're desolate, why you're in despair. So these are logical emotions in response to a pretty cataclysmic context and environment. Okay, so you've now realized that through a pretty rational process. That's excellent. And you've listed what's not going well. You've taken responsibility for that. So it means when you meet with your friends, you're not just going to complain about my life's terrible because of Elon Musk or Donald Trump or late capitalism, right? You're not just complaining about these abstract things. You have con concrete matters that are not going well and you've acknowledged them crucial moment. Stage one done, fabulous. Now let's move to stage two. Let's take something out of that column, what's not going well, what needs to change. Take one element off that list and then get another bit of paper or bring back your whiteboard. And yes, I am trying to save the world one whiteboard at a time, but okay, pick one thing that needs to change. And let's now apply some questions to this problem. And I've constructed a version of Wesley Page's great diagnostic. I've sharpened it, shortened it, and changed a few of the questions, but I really need to acknowledge this important diagnostic. So let's 
ask some questions in response to this thing that it's important to change. Okay, the first thing is specify the problem now in granular detail with precision. So you listed it the first time. Now let's put some flesh and blood and bone around this issue that's going badly. Secondly, what choices are available to you to address this problem? List those choices. Three, this is important too, what is a good, strong and beneficial outcome? So think about it, if things go well, what does a good solution look for you? Put another way, what does success look like for you at the conclusion of this problem? Crucial. Now four, how would your life improve if this choice was made? This is important because it's giving you the motivation to change. So often in our lives, you know, why are we changing? Don't go changing, right? But actually we need motivation to change and that's why thinking about how your life would improve if those changes are made, that's a really important question for. Question five, what could go wrong with this choice? Really, really important. This is risk mitigation. Very important that you do this. Okay, we're going to do this. What could go wrong and prepare yourself for it? Six, can you improve this situation or problem on your own? Or do you need some help and support? Really important. Can you fix this? Or actually, do you need mates? Do you need professional support to activate change? And be clear on that. And the final question, seven, what decisions, choices, and steps can I make today to improve this situation? Right, fantastic. That works incredibly well. Pick one problem, work through the seven questions, go for it. Then address another problem, go through the seven questions. Great. So I think this is a, a really strong process and I have tested it. I've worked with this over the last six months. And I think why it is so strong is we don't get lost in the fear or the desolation or the pain. It asks that we move along with those questions. And it means it's sort of like drinking your own body weight in Chardonnay or doing a Netflix binge. That That is no longer really the only solution you've got. There is a way out of this situation. So we start and we answer seven questions. Bad stuff happens to good people, cancer, job insecurity, restructures, housing insecurity, absolutely. But denying all these situations doesn't improve them. We have to ask the difficult questions. And, you know, as an old person talking to you, that's got more and more important, I think, as I've aged. And I think what happens when we age is, when I was younger, just so you know, when I was younger, people say, have you got any regrets? I have a, oh, I've got no regrets. Can I say, regrets come with aging and there are reasons for that. And we do need to, if you've got regrets, you do need to locate that regret, speak the regret, name the regret, and ask yourself the really tough questions. What would you have done differently. If you had your time over again, what methodology would you have deployed? And that allows you to learn from the regret. Now, this is important as we're about to move into the second stage of this outrider. We're needing to understand regret in context. Yeah. So now that we have a plan to make decisions in the present for our future, that's great. We now need to do something a bit deeper. We have to understand our past decisions in the context of that past so we can learn from them. So what we're doing now is enacting a diagnostic of our previous actions. And I'm using the fascinating research from Annie Duke and her 2020 book, How to Decide. Now, Annie Duke is a remarkable person. She has a PhD and she's also been a professional gambler. She's my kind of gal. And this book is one of the few books, I would probably list probably 20 in my whole life. This book changed me. This single book changed how I think about my life. Full stop. Now, 
I think I was a different person at the conclusion of reading this book. That's how serious I'm taking this remarkable woman's approach here. And what she argues is we really do need to understand those decisions we made in the past so we're making more honest and robust decisions in the present. We can't just sort of forget about it, the past is gone, because we'll replicate the problem. Yeah. So let's do this. And let's start with Annie Duke's two questions. Question one. What was the best decision you made in the last year? Question two. What was the worst decision you made in the last year? Very important. Take a breath. Answer those two for me. Right. Now, if you've had a shocking year like I have, you can't really think of too many good decisions. Uh, And wow, there's a lot of contenders for the worst decision that you've made. But persist with it. Persist with it, right? Answer this question. And then start to think about, hmm, What was the methodology through which I came to my best decision and my worst decision? This this is a thought experiment, but it's incredibly important because it's a test. I've just given you a test. And what this test is doing is it's assessing your best and worst decisions and how you determine them. And Duke argues that almost all of us decide the strength or the weaknesses of a decision on the basis of the outcome from that decision. Now, if you're like me, I did that. I looked at the outcome and I therefore made a decision about the decision. She argues that we must stop assessing the efficacy of a decision by the outcome of it. Poof. Duke, therefore, is offering a really important intervention in our thinking here. Decisions are not outcomes. And when we do that, we forget about the context of those decisions. We only think about the consequences. Wow. And she argues and indeed demonstrates very clearly how flawed this is as a methodology. So instead, we have to evaluate our decision-making processes. Think about the processes that we can enact to improve our decisions in our present. And she states, and this is a wow from me, quote, there are only two things that determine how your life turns out. Luck and the quality of your decisions, you only have control of one of these two things. End of quote. Duke shows that we've basically lived our lives through a false methodology, assessing how we all make high quality decisions by the outcomes of those decisions. Instead, we're not really thinking about how we've learned to make decisions. And she argues it's experiential, it's haphazard, and it's often emotional. You know that great cliche, follow your gut. What's your gut say? My gut doesn't speak, the last time I checked. But this means we only reflect on decision-making protocols when things go wrong, and often catastrophically wrong. If we configure the methodology that we're constructing in this outrider, you see it's repeatable and it's also accessible. Decisions enable the reaching of a goal, but we also need to assess the level of risk because we can't know the future. And Duke confirmed, quote, outcomes in the rear view mirror may appear larger than they actually are, end of quote. So instead, we all walk through life assuming that the bad outcomes were created by bad decisions. And Duke gave me the term for this, changed my life, resulting, resulting. I've heard about it and indeed I taught it when I taught methodology, but resulting is very, very important in the decision literature. And so resulting is the tail wagging the dog. So we assess the decision through the result, and that is how we determine success. 
Wow. So addressing resulting is incredibly important right now because we're in a toxic and a chaotic context. And that means basically there are no good decisions to make. We've got a series of pretty problematic decisions and we've got to work out what's the best of this mess. Doesn't mean that it's a bad decision. It means that we understand a decision in the context in which it was made. So we are removing what's described as hindsight bias. And we remember we carry along with the decision the context in which that decision was made rather than just sort of going, oh, after the outcome happened, oh, that was a stupid decision. I do that all the time. I've lived my entire life like that, by the way. So all the mistakes that I've made in my life, I have applied both resulting... <laughs> and a hindsight bias. And because of that, I knock myself about most days. I go, you stupid woman. You've often heard me do this. I talk to myself randomly. Oh, Tara, that was stupid. Absolutely ridiculous, Tara. What the hell were you thinking, girl? And this goes on and on and on, right? Now, I'll give you an example of, I still knock myself about, about this, right? So I'll give you an example of the worst decision that I've ever made, <laughs> right? And it comes from the worst job. I ever accepted. And can I say, it's a pretty wide field. I've, I've been in a lot of really, really terrible jobs, but let me tell you about the worst one. And of course, we've talked about it in the past, colleagues. This is the one in Canada. Nearly killed me, and it certainly nearly killed Steve. Certainly nearly killed Steve. And the weird thing is about this process is that we both did separate interviews. So it wasn't sort of a spousal thing. We both did separate interviews, two different processes, so two different eyes on this situation. And I always remember when Steve was flying off to do the interview. I'd already done mine. He was flying off to do the interview. And he was putting on his big, beautiful Italian top coat and heading off to Eastbourne Station to get to Gatwick and fly to Canada. And I always remember he said to me, Taz, don't you worry. If there's any problems, I'll find them. Bless him. Neither of us saw it. And what actually had happened to both of us during the interview process is a North Korean nuclear facility front stage had been created. So if we were looking for the bombs, we would never have had a chance to see them. So yes, we took this job. And on the first day, two of our colleagues invited us to a bar at 11 a.m. in the morning, probably the first sign. And they laughed at us. And they said, you've just made the worst decision of your life. And we had relinquished two British chairs to come here. And we said to them with some desperation, it was Steve who said this, why didn't you tell us during the interview process? And they said, oh, we needed you here because we needed allies in our fight against the Dean. So it was a catastrophic decision. And yes, I am resulting here. I am using hindsight bias. It was a huge catastrophic error. And I need to remember, though, that there was a context around this decision making, right? There was a context that created this decision and that context was Steve was being bullied, and I mean bullied heavily, at our university in the United Kingdom. And when I say bullying, bullying's used a lot as a phrase, it's almost sort of thrown into a sentence now. But the bullying that Steve confronted was excrement being placed in his office every morning so he would open the door and there would be excrement on the carpet in front of him but also a fellow professor kept on arriving in the car park when Steve was heading off home to say he wanted to fight him and also the other horrific thing that I think most upset Steve I think was that these weekly meetings were put in place between the then head of school and an HR representative who basically for half an hour every week would shout at him and explain what a terrible teacher and a researcher he was. The other key is that nobody would help him. Colleagues in the school all knew what was happening, but they were gutless, to be frank. And that's why to this day I am so staunch about the importance of bystanders doing something. Because if bystanders don't speak, 
don't act, don't send that email to a line manager, then the results are catastrophic. But the context of our decision to go to Canada, therefore, was I needed desperately to get Steve away from this context of bullying and harassment because I thought I would lose him. I thought he would top himself. And the problem is desperation <laughs> breeds really poor decision-making methodologies. But look, I've learnt that. Yes, I've got to stop this hindsighting. I've got to stop this resulting, this confirmation bias. I need to, whenever I think about the Canadian experience and the Canadian decision, I need to carry the context of that decision with it and I need to forgive myself. Finally, I need to forgive myself for that catastrophic error. And Duke reminds us that all decisions contain risk and we rarely think about the risks enough. We also too often, I think, make decisions about you know what my gut thinks or what I believe. What do I believe to be true? What does my gut say? Too often, I think, and I'm really conscious of this, I'm taking this critique strongly on, we have far too much confidence in what we think we know. And we're not inquisitive enough to work out what we don't know. Decisions must be based on information and on evidence, and we must search for the information beyond our feelings, beyond what we would like to find. Duke used a phrase that again changed my life. I've written it on a post-it note and I look at it every morning. Quote, your beliefs create a bottleneck to good decision-making. Your beliefs create a bottleneck to good decision making, end of quote. My life changed. Therefore, part of our methodology when we're thinking about decision making must include conscious decisions to find information beyond what we know because decision making is shaped by confirmation bias. We see and we value the information that reinforces what we already know. And we apply disconfirmation bias. I didn't even know this was a thing. We apply a more critical standard of understanding information to the stuff that contradicts what we believe. Yeah. So let's all think about our prior decisions. And let's think about them now with kindness and carry their context forward with us recognizing resulting confirmation bias and hindsight bias. I've done all three for almost all of my adult life. Just because we want something to be true doesn't mean that it is true. Therefore, the final part of the Outrider today, and thank you for hanging with me, lots of technical issues today, but thank you for hanging with me. We're going to look at the methodology to improve our decision-making in real time. And in real time today, we're going to move from opinion to expertise, from experience to expertise, and get rid of that confirmation bias by focusing on information literacy. Why are bad decisions made? And remember, I'm not using resulting here or hindsight bias. Why do bad decisions happen in real time? Haman et al. argues that bad decisions emerge when alternatives are not envisioned and realised, the correct and accurate information is not gathered, and the costs and the benefits are not accurately assembled. Brilliant, that. Brilliant advice, I think, and very useful. But then let's get to the bit that may change your life. From Tinsley, Dylan and Madsen they confirmed that one clear strategy to gather information that we often neglect is to understand and to log the small daily failures in our lives. So what happens is, from when we're a kid, primary socialization, we're taught to sort of shake it off, shake stuff off, get yourself up, dust yourself off and keep going, right? So something happens, get up and keep going. And we have that cliche that we're taught, again, when we're kids, it's not as bad as you think. 
Now, the problem is almost always it is as bad as you think it is. Just because a failure or a wound in our daily life did not kill us does not mean that we should minimize or reduce its meaning. You see, rarely does a cataclysmic decision emerge in our daily lives. Rarely does something absolutely debilitating occur in our lives. Might happen five or six times in an 80 year life where you go, oh, that's a shocker. Rarely does that happen. But every day, some micro troubles and problems and traumas emerge. And because we don't listen and we don't learn to those micro traumas and troubles and, and mistakes and failures, fundamental problems remain until they become catastrophic. So therefore we need to stay present in the present. We need to log and understand our small failures and work out what those small failures are teaching us. The worst thing we can do, and I now know this, the worst thing we can do is experience a mini failure like a ooh, ow, ooh, 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 and brush it aside, pretend it doesn't mean anything, and don't use it as a decision-making protocol. You see, indecision, doing nothing, builds up into a pressure cooker in our lives where we're cornered. And the trouble is when we're cornered, we can only make bad decisions. So we need to be present in our present. Yeah. And finally, summon help. So important. Decisions, bad decisions, are often done by individuals that are using resulting and confirmation bias and hindsight bias, right? So we need to create a group of diverse and robust and brilliant people around us who tell us the truth, not what we want to hear. All of us have resulting confirmation bias and hindsight bias. But the thing is, when a group of people come together, we all mitigate and manage each other's biases, right? So we all have this view, this is right, I'm right. But suddenly when you've got 10 brilliant people around you, your decision making starts to improve because your information literacy increases with the group. So make sure that you have a group of people, one, two, three, four, five people around you who care for you. And they also care for your decisions. So they understand the problems and they help you develop a diverse evidential base when you come to make that decision. And when they offer commentary, Listen to them. Yeah. So your methodology to make decisions will improve if you've got these honest, brilliant and robust people around you. And by the way, poor leaders, and we've got a lot of them at the moment, in universities and in life, poor leaders apply the Peter Principle. And the Peter Principle is mediocre people put other mediocre people around them uh, so that they're never shown up. So they all are mediocre together and no one actually realises, oh, this is a bit of a mess, hey. So Peter Principle is important. And we've seen the consequences of the Peter Principle in our universities, but also on the world stage. So let's not be of their number. Let's be courageous. Let's apply the methodology that we talked about in the first part of this Outrider. Let's do a diagnostic on ourselves and understand our past decisions in context and start to manage the regret that we've been carrying every day. And then let's today intervene in business as usual. Let's gather diverse information. Let's understand those micro warnings and failures in our daily life. And let's put brilliant people around us to stop our confirmation bias. We can change our lives one good decision at a time. Sam, I'm so grateful to you. Thank you for this suggestion. And I wish you all love, light and peace. Tia.